Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Molly Starback, Director of the Office of Postdoctoral Services, and I'd like to welcome you to our panel discussion on careers in research administration. This workshop is part of the academic job search series and is co-sponsored by the Graduate School. And I'd like to begin by thanking our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us this morning. We really appreciate y'all sharing your advice with our postdocs and graduate students today. And our panelists are Lauren Anderson, PhD, who is director of the Duke Surgery Office of Research Development. Her PhD is in neurobiology from UNC Chapel Hill, and she is a former Duke postdoc in neurology. Jenny Ariansen is director of research integrity for the Duke Advancing Scientific Integrity Services and Training Office. She has an MS in neurobiology and neuroscience from UNC Chapel Hill, and we just learned that she has a new baby, so we will be asking her the <laughs> work-life balance question. Congratulations, Jenny. And Brandon Hall, PhD, is scientific program leader for the Duke Surgery Office of Research Development. His PhD is in pharmacology from Georgia Health Sciences University, and he was a Duke postdoc in psychiatry and behavioral sciences. And Sunita Patil, PhD, is Associate Director of Research and our research guru for My Research Navigators. And Sunita, I believe you did your um, postdoc at UCSF, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Right. So I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves briefly and give us a little bit of their backgrounds, and then we'll start with questions. Many of you submitted your questions online. Thank you for that. So we'll start with those, and then we'll move to questions from the audience. Uh, as always, please feel free to unmute yourself or put questions in the chat. So if we'd like to start alphabetically, um, that would be you, Lauren. All right. Um, not quite sure what else to add on <laughs> uh, what you said, um, but I was in research for about 12 years before transitioning out of the lab. Um, really kind of fell into the role, uh, see a need, fill a need. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. I'm really not sure what else to ask. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you, Lauren. Jenny, how about you? Hey, everybody. I'm Jenny Ariansen. Um, let's see. So yeah, so I did my graduate work at UNC in neurobiology and then made a um, intentional move away from bench science to research support and research facilitation. And I did that um, at UNC. And then I was at FHI 360, uh, helping to manage some pediatric and maternal HIV clinical trials. Then I saw this position open at Duke. Actually, a friend of mine from graduate school connected me to the position. I wasn't actually looking at that time. Um, the position was called a research integrity associate. And it was different enough that it really caught my eye. And um, it was it was in the research support area of research integrity rather than the compliance and regulatory areas of research integrity. And that really appealed to me. And that's what, what brought me to Duke. I'll pass back to you, Molly. Thank you, Jenny. And Brandon, how about you? Yeah, so uh, in my former life, I did research on addiction, neural mechanisms of addiction, um, uh, animal models, uh, operant behavior, uh, and a lot of cognition, learning, and memory work as well. Uh, some environmental toxicity work, uh, very little. Um, and uh, yeah, that brought me to Duke. Uh, and I was a postdoc here, and I was always interested in careers outside of uh, going pure sort of academic professor route. Um, and so I explored uh, quite a few uh, different avenues, um, but this particular job that I do now uh, uh, came up. A um, bit of a long story. I could get into it maybe later if anybody wants to hear it, but, uh, you know, bottom line, that's how I got here. We've, we've been with the Department of Surgery now for eight eight years, I think, yeah. All right, thank you. So our first question is, your jobs involve research, administrative, and management responsibilities. Can you describe those responsibilities and give us an idea of a typical day? I think we left out Sunita. Oh, Sunita, <laughs> I'm so sorry. 
Yeah, so um, just to give you a little bit of background, I mean, I uh, did my PhD back in India. I came here for postdoc at UCSF. And um, I was there for three and a half years. I worked for uh, Unilever for uh, their Elizabeth Arden division for a couple of years. And then um, I was working um, in a uh, lab as a consultant at OHSU in Portland, Oregon. And uh, suddenly that lab had to close down because of some financial uh, difficulties that they ran into. And uh, suddenly I was out of job. And so, you know, there was like uh, three or four years where I could not find job at that time. And I had two kids at, uh, at that time as well. And so, you know, I was taking care of them. And then eventually we moved to uh, North Carolina and I was promised a job actually in GSK. And then when we moved over here, they said they moved the entire dermatology division to uh, uh, Philadelphia. And so again, I was like back to square one. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm gonna go get into academia again. And so, you know, um, there happened to be a job uh, for a CIFAR, uh, that is Center for AIDS Research. They needed somebody as a consultant for that and also somebody who could uh, help them with progress reports and also help the investigators do their research. And so that's how, you know, like I got into Duke. Thank you very much, Sunita. Mm -hmm. and um, maybe you'd like to start on what a typical day is like for you and juggling all the responsibilities you have, which I know are many. Yeah. So uh, what we do right now, um, a typical day would be, you know, like pretty much uh, one consult after uh, consult after another. So uh, what what I really do in my job is to pretty much help all the research faculty, staff, students, whoever it may be. Uh, to answer any questions about the resources that they need for doing their research. We also tell them, you know, like how to design their research. We also give them information about what's the best way to collect data or, you know, like find facilities, uh, uh, you know, or equipment, whatever it is, you know, to do their research. And so, um, as we all know, like Duke is very decentralized. And so that's why, you know, like a lot of times, even people who've been here for a long time, they don't really know where the resources are. So typically my day would be like, we are going from one consultant to another, uh, talking to people about, you know, what the resources are. Um, and we also do a lot of uh, onboarding uh, work as well, in the, which means that, you know, anybody who is new to Duke or anybody who is transitioning into a faculty position, they're required to meet with us and do like a 90 hour, 90 minute um, uh, consult. And during that time, we introduce them to not only the resources, but then also, you know, like um, uh, they they come to know about uh, the policies that are involved, how Duke functions, you know, because every uh, university or every institution is very different. So we tell them how Duke functions as well, and then basically uh, tailor our response in a way that, uh, you know, uh, tailor our consult in a way that is uh, relevant to the portfolio that the PI brings to Duke. Great, thank you, Sunita. Lauren, how about you? Sure, so in my role, there's probably three primary areas that I work in. The bulk of our work is like the hardcore editing of grant proposals, um, but part of that too is also working one-on-one -on -one with faculty to develop their ideas. So see what they're interested in, see how they're telling that story, making sure that that comes across on the page, um, and then sort of looking for funding announcements, guiding them through working directly with program officers, um, that sort of thing. And in our particular group, we're part of the research support infrastructure within the department. Um, a lot of schools will have research development offices at the school level, but we're increasingly seeing um, more uh, support be added at the department level as well. So we'll work with our institutional counterparts um, as well as with the other core labs and support services within the department. Um, to make sure that our processes are flowing smoothly. We work very closely with the grant administrators on, 
you know, the financial pieces of uh, grant proposals. Um, and since we're more familiar with the work, we're actually able to be pretty good uh, co-workers with the grant administrators, answering their questions um, and kind of taking some of that administrative burden off of the faculty member. Thank you, Lauren. And Brandon, since you and Lauren work together, maybe it would make sense for you to chime in next. Yeah, so if we, if we didn't make it clear, Lauren and I are on the same team. Uh, Lauren is our director. Um, and so my day is about the same as what she said, only I don't have to deal with a lot of the administrative meetings that Lauren is constantly being drug into, and I'm not up too upset about that. Um, but yeah, my my typical day is meeting one-on-one uh, -on -one typically with our faculty and going over their ideas, uh, trying to get their ideas on paper, and then uh, really heavily editing. I mean, that's that's the majority of my day is it would be editing um specific aims pages research strategies and putting together you know all the ancillary attachments of a proposal things like facilities and bio sketches and all that kind of stuff but primarily we we make our money with really really editing people's ideas because when, when we say editing we, we don't mean like you know making sure your i's are dotted and t's are crossed you know and your commas are all in the right place it's really about looking at someone's research story and idea and saying, does this make sense? Are they asking the right questions? You know, are there, are there specific aims, you know, up to speed, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's where the bulk of my, my work is. And I probably should say a typical day isn't very typical. Our, our work, you know, is very, it's not, it's not a punch clock kind of job. It's, it's kind of what, whatever work you have at any given moment is kind of what you're doing. And it's all, always a little bit different each time. Thank you, Brandon and Jenny. Hi, everybody. It's it's fun to hear what other folks like me are up to. So I'm getting a lot from the panel already, um, especially from you, Lauren and Brandon, since I haven't yet had the opportunity to work closely with y'all. Um, Sunita and I actually work pretty closely together. The Duke Office of Scientific Integrity, it's what I would call sort of a sister office to the Duke Office of Research Initiatives. Um, and I was sitting here thinking about this question. I was like, oh, let me look at my calendar and see what I'm up to right today. So for example, today um, I had a check-in. So I managed five folks. I had a check-in with one of my folks. Um, I checked in with our associate um, dean for scientific integrity on some event planning. We're trying to coordinate actually with with the Dory group, another arm that's not Sunita's arm. Um, <laughs> and I'm here at this meeting, and then later I'll be going to um, a team meeting for the NIH data management and sharing policy that we're in the midst of implementing here at Duke. Um, that's a part of the work that we do is support data management planning. Um, the NIH and other funders are coming out with uh, more requirements for data management planning and particularly data sharing. And that's a big part of what, what our office does. So we work um, both on institution-wide, what I'll say, workflow generation. So we're working to meet researchers where they are, regardless of um, specialty. And then we also offer one-on-one -on -one consults for data management planning. So in a given day, I might be in this area working with the team, um, reviewing data management and sharing plans, with a researcher one-on-one, -on -one, talking with them about their specific research area, um, or setting up a red cap so that we can manage a workflow for a department or a school. Um, and then later today, I have a research quality management planning meeting with our research quality management team. Um, that's a school of medicine program that works with uh, designees in each department. So their leadership in the research space and the research in tech, um, the research administration space. And we have folks from every department come together and we have created a community in the name of research quality. And so that that's my day today. Um, and there are other areas that that we cover, but that's that's today. Thank you, Jenny. So um, could we talk about what kind of experiences during your graduate and postdoctoral training prepared you for your positions? 
Lauren, would you like to start again? Uh, grant writing, manuscript writing, grant writing, <laughs> running a lab meeting, um, and being being comfortable asking questions and figuring out how to find your own answers. All of those translate very well into research and proposal development work. Thank you, Lauren. Jenny, how about you? This is a great question. Um, the I had always had questions about the integrity space and the questions that I had in graduate school came primarily around the notion of consent. We were using um, mice rat models and we were expanding our technique into a monkey model while I was in graduate school. Um, and so these questions around um, the conduct of research were coming up for me. Um, and I decided at some point I didn't want to work with animal models anymore. I said, I'd rather work with human beings on the questions of consent. And I realized after I got into some of that, that work, some of those same questions were, were still there and present for me. Um, and that led me into the integrity space. But the work of organizing my research question and being willing to fail and get back up and keep trying prepared me sort of globally for this experience, but also um, with our integrity associates in our team, what's great about folks who have research experience um, is that they have worked with faculty members. They know how to speak with a faculty member. They know some of the pain points about what it means to communicate with faculty members and some of the burdens that faculty members often have. And um, usually that kind of experience prepares folks for those conversations, which are sometimes difficult in the administration space when a faculty member perceives you as creating a burden for them. And so my role is to help them overcome their burdens. And sometimes that's overcoming the burden of why are we having this conversation? Um, and so there is a significant communication component to the work that we do in addition to just the advantages of what it means to have conducted research and to have your specialty area. So on our team, everyone has a PhD and has some experience in research um, and um, has it has what I would call a specialty research area. Right. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. And Brandon, I'm not sure if you're still there anymore. Um, so maybe we'll go to Sunita and then back up to Brandon. Yeah, so for me, <clears throat> during my postdoc, um, uh, our, uh, our lab used to have a ton of people from all over Europe who used to come, you know, to do like projects over summer or over a period of six months or some uh, something like that. And so uh, usually what my PI would do is that there were two or three of us who had PhDs. And so what he would typically do is to, um, uh, to uh, he would ask us to basically guide these MDs to do their research. So they had a research idea or sometimes they wouldn't even have an idea, but they had to go back with a paper, you know, I mean, uh, which showed that, you know, they did something uh, while they were here at UCSF. And so we would give them research ideas. We would also, you know, like give them um, guidance in terms of how to design their study, how to collect data, and then also, you know, like uh, how to write a paper and that sort of stuff. And so, you know, like uh, that really did help me in terms of doing what I'm doing right now. Um, the only thing uh, that I really didn't know at that time was how things worked on the back end, you know, like uh, of doing uh, human subject research because the IRB and everything was taken care of for us. I, I really did not have to do any of that. And uh, so when I um, came to Duke, you know, I really wanted to learn how to do that. And uh, while I was working with CIFAR, I also started learning how to, you know, like manage the back end of research. So in terms of integrity, in terms of, um, you know, like quality management, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, you know, like um, uh, IRB uh, applications, whatever it was. I mean, you know, it was good to sort of learn all that while I was on a job. And um, the other good thing also was uh, that, you know, like uh, with, um, uh, uh, with CIFAR, I got to also help a ton of uh, investigators, you know, who were doing their research 
in uh, the HIV space. And so, you know, uh, between my job and my postdoc, it really helped me to do what I'm doing today. Super, thank you, Sunita. Mm -hmm. And Brandon, how about you? Yeah, so sorry, I had to get off there for a minute. My very large dog informed me he needed to go outside. So. But uh, yeah, um, definitely writing grants um, helped a lot to prepare me for what I do now, but also writing my own manuscripts and editing other people's manuscripts. Um, but I would also put a plug in if anybody here hasn't taken it, the Write Winning Grants course that's offered uh, yearly. Um, it's an outstanding course uh, and helped me out a lot. Uh, I, I, I should say I took that as a postdoc when I was here, so I would highly recommend it. You know, for what if, if you're going to stay in this space at all, if you're going to be, you know, pursue a, a professorship or whatever, or you know, it's definitely worth it. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. And I think that's usually offered in the summer, is it? And now it's yeah, I think it's like June or July ish, somewhere around there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, and a COVID bonus is that it used to be in person and there were a limited number of seats, and now it's virtual and there's plenty of seats. So that's a good thing that happened. So this um, leads into a question of what advice might you have for a postdoc or graduate student? who would like to move into one of these positions. So in addition to obviously writing grants or manuscripts, taking right winning grants, what other advice might y'all have? I would say if you're interested in one of these positions to reach out to any one of the four of us um, to connect, um, to stay in communication with Molly, who is con super connected with us and um, try to find folks that you could, have either explicit or implicit mentor relationships with in this space. Um, there's a, you know, some, car some new ground being carved here. And so, I, you know, I'd say, I'll speak for myself to say that um, I often work with folks who are just completing their postdoc and um, folks who are coming just out of their postdoc would be a candidate for like a research integrity associate position, which I'll, we're actually hiring for one now. And I'll put that, that, that link in the chat here so you can get a flavor for the kinds of candidates um, or the kinds of responsibilities you might have if you were to apply to our team. And you get a great boss if you apply for that job, everyone. <laughs> oh, I'm a meanie. <laughs> yeah, so for us, for what we do, so research development is kind of an umbrella term for uh, several different things and it's, it's still not exactly well-defined. Most people are kind of kind of do what we do under research development, um, but there's there's a scattering of folks like us all throughout Duke, and everybody kind of does something a little bit different. Um, so, you know, you could definitely reach out to Lauren and I, and we could you know plug you into that space, and maybe you know get uh, maybe you can get a feel for with talking with some folks, you know, what everybody kind of does and. You know if, if you might be interested in, in that kind of work. I'd say for anybody that's looking at these positions kind of more generally is to get used to thinking outside of your specialty that you know the general skills that you acquire through your PhD, critical thinking, asking questions, um, are incredibly valuable in the proposal development space because you're not the expert. So if you're able to understand what's in that proposal, you know, minus some super technical terms, then that's probably a strong proposal. Um, one of the things that I've had to do over the years with recruiting postdocs is train them out of thinking that they are what they did in graduate school and as a postdoc. Um, I mean, Brandon and I are in the Department of Surgery. We are not surgeons. I spent a lifetime avoiding cancer biology, and half of the grants we work on are cancer biology. So, Same. you know, not being afraid to, you know, go into a space where you are completely unfamiliar. It's really the ability to, to tell a story, to ask a question, and to draw out a clear answer. So getting comfortable outside of your your area of expertise 
uh, is extremely helpful. Yeah, the joke I've always said is that as a graduate student, as a postdoc, the two major fields I wanted nothing to do with were cancer and immunology. And since coming to surgery, like 90% of what I've worked with has been either cancer or some form of immunology. So, so yeah, be, be, being, being comfortable, you know, being able to read things and, and decipher them sort of outside of your own given field. I mean, I've, literally, there, there's nothing for what I did, you know, in terms of the Department of Surgery from my own area of expertise, you know, as a postdoc, you know, just hadn't touched anything remotely close. Yeah. I mean, uh, say, uh, I, I would say exactly the same. I mean, you know, um, I always say, like, I'm a jack of all, but master of none, you know, and um, that really helps me do my job right now. Uh, like, when we do our postdocs and when we do our PhD, we are so focused in one little field and we over specialize in that field, basically. And so the thing is that um, it's uh, where, when you're looking for these type of jobs, you need to sort of think. Um, outside the box, like Lauren said, uh, you might want to go uh, through, you know, like um, the job uh, uh, job postings on the HR website, sort of see, you know, like uh, what kind of uh, jobs are posted out there, see what interests you the most, and then, you know, try to um, to uh, to either learn it, you know, like while you are doing your postdoc, I don't know how much time you would have, but otherwise, you know, reach out to folks like us and sort of, you know, like um, ask us, you know, what kind of training you should be taking or uh, what should you do to sort of prepare yourself for the job. So, you know, you don't have to be expert at anything, basically, you can be expert in nothing, but still do a job and uh, believe it or not, at Duke, they also create jobs for you. You know, like if they know that you are really good at something, um, like the job that uh, I was the first RPL that was pretty much uh, hired over here because they designed that uh, position around what, what I did. So, you know, like if they rec recognize that you have expertise in this field and this is something that would benefit the general research community, then they'll 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 design a job for you too. So that's excellent advice, Sunita. Thank you. And you touch on um, one of our next questions, which is how can postdocs and students find these opportunities? I know you know you, this position was created for you. Jenny mentioned that she has a position open now that's on the Duke HR website. Um, you know, I know this is a growing field, like Warren. You know, used to work for the General Office of um, Research Support. Now you're in a department. So can you talk about that? Like how, where to look? Um, yeah. Oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry, Lauren. Sure. So for, for research development positions, you know, we're in academic and industry spaces. So you'll see research development, proposal development, um, institutions use an array of job titles. Um, grant administrators at Duke are primarily financial people, but if you're looking in Utah or some other institutions, research administration also means proposal development and research development. Um, so kind of looking at proposal development as a keyword uh, is probably the best way to find these roles or positions um, at the really large companies, you'll see them as business development as well, but you just kind of have to look in the description for something that says proposal or idea development, something like that. Good. Thank I you. I personally Adam. would recommend uh, Molly Starback because I got my job from the lists that she sends out like weekly. I still get those emails too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I do try to focus on like, you know, I figure most postdocs and graduate students know how to find a faculty position. How about all those other positions out there? So, yeah, in fact, uh, we are looking for, um, uh, we'll be shortly looking for a couple of positions. One, you know, like who is going to be, um, an expert in basic sciences and sort of knows Duke really well and how Duke functions. And um, and so, you know, like that posting might come up in a little bit. 
and also, you know, the other one that we are looking into, and I think Rebecca can talk more about it, or even Jenny would be uh, would know about it, is um, in the data space as well. But uh, the thing is that uh, you know what uh, I would suggest is definitely talk to um, uh, look into the HR uh, listings. That was definitely the way that I got into research. And don't hesitate to apply for as many jobs as you want, because you know, like being new um, uh, to North Carolina and not knowing, you know, anybody, um, uh, you know, like is is hard to get a job. So I just applied randomly, you know, like to any job and every job that I could practically, uh, you know, like see on the HR listings. And that helps because, you know, like um, out of, you know, persistence helps because, you know, out of uh, 50 job, uh, you know, like um, job applications, one of them will actually reach out to you and at least, you know, give you an opportunity to uh, have a, an interview with them. And if that's so, then, you know, you should be able to make an impression and at least get your foot through the door. And once you have your foot through the door, then uh, the sky is your limit. Then. Thank you, Sunita. Jenny, any advice? Yeah, the only other thing I'll say besides staying connected to folks who are working where you think you might want to work, even if you just tiny bit think you might want to work there, reach out to folks like us here. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, uh, as to, to piggyback off what Sunita said, apply to apply to a lot of different kinds of jobs. Take the um, interviews as you get them. Practice, um, and you you don't really ever know what's going to come up. I mean, I like I said, this this notion of a research integrity associate isn't universal at other institutions. That you you probably won't find a position like this, and so there's some uniqueness to the positions that we hire for. Um, and having said that, there is a, this, this field of data sharing, data management is, is huge and is gonna be um, a great place to plug in to, to research support. Um, and so in addition to the keywords that we also mentioned, but just to, to practice, even if you think, oh, this might not be what I wanna do, go ahead and take it and, and practice. And I like to piggyback on that a little bit as well. As Anita mentioned, um, having that interview gives somebody at that organization an introduction to you. So if they meet you and they learn about, you know, where your strengths are and what you're interested in, they may have a colleague that has a position open that would be a better match for you. And that creates an opportunity for them to refer you for that. So absolutely, whatever chance you have to, to meet with people in an organization, is an opportunity for you to get referred elsewhere if you wind up not being a match for that particular position. That is all excellent advice, thank you. So some of you have open jobs or are going to have open jobs. Um, how should postdocs uh, structure their resume or CV when they're applying for this kind of position? Do you wanna see their 15 page CV? <laughs> I actually think this is an excellent question because it, it goes back to what Lauren said earlier about kind of getting out of your, your headspace of where you typically are as a postdoc, which is like, well, I'm working in a lab and I'm doing science and I'm doing experiments. And, you know, this these jobs are not like that. I can remember, you know, what I did after researching what this particular job and career path does. You know, I tailored my resume to basically reflect the writing experiences that I had had you know, not just with writing my own, you know, publications and grants, but also things like, you know, I wrote up like lab protocols and procedures and whatever other things I could think of that I had experience, you know, writing and, and anal analyzing and, and thinking critically about, you know, again, for this particular job. Um, you know, even if you take things like, you know, everybody's looking at like data sets or data that you make in the lab, you know, and, and you're analyzing that and trying to figure out what your data is telling you will kind of bump that up a level, so to speak. And, you know, that also means that you're able to, to just look at a piece of information and think critically about it and kind of, I don't know, deconstruct it doesn't sound like the right word to use, but for lack of a better term, you know, to don't sort of deconstruct it and turn it inside out and, you know, um, come up with something from it, if that makes sense.
Other advice, Lauren? No, I don't know that I have anything to add to that. I think, you know, being able to demonstrate your ability to think around a topic, a lot of what we do is problem solving. So, you know, being able to be a resource to a colleague or, you know, kind of work in that way um, should also come across in the resume. Yeah, um, what I would say is that, you know, like read the job description. I mean, see if that interests you. And then, you know, like, um, make sure that uh, you know you include that information as to you know what experience do you have in that space whether you know uh, and how how best you would fit you know like in that particular job and what is it that you can bring to your job and if you don't have any experience in the field say that you are really curious to learn about it you know i mean and um, if there is uh, not an experienced candidate that's available, I mean, you still have a good chance of being hired and, uh, you know, being trained in, uh, in that position. So anyone and everyone that I have on my team, I mean, you know, we have to train them separately because this is something that cannot be taught. And so, um, you know, we basically sit down and we show them how to do that. We shadow, you know, like people who uh, go out and do onboarding and all that, and then you know we let them go solo. So you know, there's always a um, there's always uh, you know uh, a way to sort of you know like get um, get to know your job, and then also you know like uh, you can also learn on your job, and you can tell them that you are you you have the ability to be um, not ability, but uh, you are curious enough to sort of you know like learn what it takes to do the job as well. You don't have to be an expert on your first day. Mm -hmm. right. Jenny, how about you? What are you looking for? Uh, my answer to this is a little bit more logistical, I think. Um, in addition to what everyone else has already said, I think the main one of the main barriers is getting past HR. So when you apply for a position at a place like Duke, the first your resume or CV is going to be reviewed first by an HR person who is unfamiliar with your work experience and maybe unfamiliar also with what's needed for the job. And so um, they will be scanning your CV for keywords that are you can pull directly from the job posting. And I would suggest that you do that to get past the HR process and to have them pass your resume on to the hiring manager. Um, the other thing that you can do is apply and then email the hiring manager or someone at the office if you're aware of who's hiring and just say, hey, I want I'm attaching my CV. I want to let you know that I applied for this position. I'm interested in it and then insert your reason for why you're interested. Um, let me know if you'd like to set up a time to talk. Um, as a hiring manager, I can, there's a few different things I can do on my end to make sure that I'm getting the best candidates for a position. So um, what I'll often do is tell HR to send them, send me everyone who applies rather than having to go through their sift, sifting process. Um, but I almost always, I would say, I say almost always, but I would say always, I think is probably better respond to someone who reaches out to me directly. Um, so I would suggest be bold and go ahead and do that. Reach out. You've got nothing to lose, right? And only to gain. I'd also say for a position that involves writing like ours, having a cover letter so that I could have a first example of how it is you write is incredibly helpful for me um, because if if the job or if your application does get out of HR, having that is probably the way I'm going to determine like who I'm going to interview and who I don't. And no chat GPT, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, those are easy to figure out. Those are easy to figure out. That is excellent advice. Thank you. And I heartily agree with the information on reaching out to people directly, if you can find out who the hiring manager is. And if you're not a good candidate, they're not going to hold a grudge, right? It's just like, thanks very much for your interest. So yeah, that's wonderful. So um, moving ahead to the interview process, 
do you have any, um, can you share what the interview process for these types of position might be like? I'll say for us, um, the first pass is going to be some type of writing or editing exercise. Um, and we are looking for, you know, how thoroughly you're considering what's on the page, how comfortable you wind up being with the material on the page. Um, when Brandon applied, he, he completely, there was maybe five original words left in uh, what he submitted back to us. Um, and so that was, you know, our indication that he had a really strong command of, you know, the structure of, in that case, it was an abstract and an AIMS page. Um, so really demonstrating the skills. Once you get past that um, in the interview, I'm going to test in real time sort of how comfortable you are outside of your area of expertise. And just having that conversation, what kinds of questions are you asking? Are you being thoughtful about what's interested you in this position? Um, and telling you a little bit more about how our group works because every group is a little bit different. So having that opportunity to kind of get exposure uh, is, is usually what the interview process is, the writing exercise and you know, an interview with the hiring manager and maybe another member of the office uh, is the typical process for us. <clears throat> so uh, to prepare for the interview process, um, the thing is that, uh, you know, like what I typically look for, um, for someone to be on my team is how open they are to sort of juggle different uh, things at the same time, right? I mean, it's not easy to, uh, or it's not everybody's personality to um, to juggle different projects at the same time. And so what we do in our job is to juggle a lot of different things uh, every time. Also, you know, like when we get questions, uh, whenever I say like, oh, you know, I know a lot of these things. I mean, there is always a question every single day where I don't even know where to begin. And so, um, you know, you have to be curious enough to sort of, you know, dig into the information, uh, reach out to various folks um, and not be shy. You know, no question is a dumb question. And so, you know, like you just have to uh, put your ego aside and basically reach out to anyone you, who you think can help you to find the right answer to help the faculty. Um, <clears throat> the thing is that, you know, like um, when it comes to uh, our job ratings, you know, like uh, we have to present our job ratings, you know, like as a group to uh, the higher uh, administration. And so, you know, we always make sure that, you know, like we have helped the uh, faculty in the best possible way to do their research and also, you know, like to uh, to be able to um, save them a lot of time from just going back and forth and trying to find the information on their own. So, yeah, I mean, I would say one thing is that uh, experience at Duke um, and then, you know, how how much curiosity do you have? and, you know, be able to juggle different projects at the same time. Thank you, Sunita. Jenny, Brandon, any thoughts or? Um, yeah, I think I would say that a lot of what Sunita offered um, also applies in the work that our office does. Um, folks who come to the research integrity work often don't necessarily have direct experience in research integrity. They may come with their own question about research integrity as it has related to their work. Um, and so there's a set of skills that we're looking for. Multitasking, the ability to multitask is one. Um, we also um, host a responsible conduct of research training. And so having um, some experience offering presentations or some comfort in front of groups of people um, is, is helpful for the work that we do. And then um, 
there's a component of our work that's that's generally a, a wild card. Um, a lot of what we do isn't necessarily the same day in and day out. And so being um, emotionally and mentally agile enough to to take those changes on as they come up is is an important part of that as well. But um, for a an interview for our office, um, I usually have a about a 30 minute conversation with folks initially. I have a specific conversation with them about the salary range for the position, particularly if they're an external candidate, because that is not posted on the Duke HR website. So I go ahead and have that conversation and say, hey, are we going to meet your salary requirements for this position? Um, and then I, I offer them a little bit, um, you know, to Lauren's point, what, what we do, a flavor of what we offer um, to our, our, what I'll call our customers, our researchers, um, and see if that feels like a good fit. And if it does, a mutually good fit, then I'll bring folks in for a conversation with the team. And then um, we make our hiring decisions um, collaboratively. So everyone on the team has an equal say in who we hire. Um, as a manager, I'm not sort of, I'm not the, the decider is what, is what I'll say. And so um, there's an opportunity for applicants to communicate to a bunch of different people. And so there may be um, a fit there that might not necessarily be the fit that's for me that works better for the team. Um, and so we try to offer that for folks who are applying for our positions. Thank you, Jenny. And you brought up the S word or salary. So maybe we can continue with that. Can you give us a ballpark idea of what salaries are for these types of positions? Yeah, let's see. So for the research integrity associate positions, they're a school of medicine, um, medicine nursing managed position. So at Duke, there are med nursing managed positions. There are provost area managed positions. Um, and those positions are tiered differently across the different areas. Um, on the School of, uh, not School of Medicine, on the Duke HR website, there is a job classifications um, Excel spreadsheet that you can download. I'll put the link here in a minute to get a sense of the range for the, for the positions. Um, I'll say as a hiring manager, I don't actually set the offer position. HR sets that based on your experience. So they basically run a calculation of your years of experience related to the position, which is another reason why you want to put the keywords in your CV so that they calculate that experience as a part of your experience to get to raise your salary a bit. Um, and folks with a PhD who come onto my team as a level 12 research integrity associate generally make somewhere between, um, it's like a, it's about a third or fourth year postdoc salary. So, or a little bit more if you have some work experience, maybe before you started your PhD related to the, to the, to the job. Um, so folks come in making somewhere between like 62 to 75, depending on their research experience. And then I have a couple of research project managers who range from like 80 to 100,000 per year. Um, one has a PhD, one no, two have PhDs, one has an MS, but a lot of work experience. She's sort of end of career um, in terms of the arc of her work trajectory. Um, and so those are the two main positions that we hire for. So that's the range. Let me find the um, website for the uh, spreadsheet that sort of lists that out for the positions that you may be applying for. If that's okay, is that okay, Molly? Oh yeah, no, that's fabulous. Okay. No, that's and and just so everybody knows, um, there's the internal Duke website for any positions at UNC or public universities. That's usually public information, so you can look it up there as well. So, Lauren, how about you? Uh, honestly, about the same at Duke. You know, those ranges are set by the level. So, you know, when you download the spreadsheet and you look at it, um, it becomes kind of clear sort of where you know level 12 level 14 um and so on kind of fall but yeah it starts somewhere around that third or fourth year postdoc salary and, and goes up from there sunita or brandon yeah i would say uh you know whatever jen and lauren said pretty much the same because um 
even the folks that start on my team um, usually start around 70 to 80 uh, and so and then go up from there so and and i'll say too in the academic market a lot of our roles are becoming more fluid in terms of on-site versus hybrid versus fully remote um, and so you may see differences at other institutions based on your location. Um, so that's something else to, to keep an eye out on when you're looking at the positions as well. Good point. Thank you, Lauren. And um, as you know, about half of our postdocs are international. Can you talk about, or are you able to hire postdocs or PhDs who, um, require visa sponsorship? That's a great question. And um, I haven't hired yet um, with the visa sponsorship. And so I saw this question actually reached out to my HR person to find out the answer. Um, and she directed me to the Duke Visa Services office, and that is the best answer I have right now. I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that I wish that I had more to offer for this question. Yeah, so, same here. I don't know um, because I haven't hired anybody either. And so I don't know. I'll, we'll have to check on that and see. So we are, um, but that's also related to the source of our funds. Um, we're on institutional dollars and not grant dollars. Some offices are run off of grant funds and may have limitations. In our case, we don't have that limitation, but we need lead time. So if they're looking to hire in a short time frame, that may be an issue. But if you are the best candidate, um, most groups are more concerned about getting the best candidate and you know, we'll wait a month or two if it's going to take time to to process a visa application. Um, among my colleagues, if an applicant in the pool is an international applicant that we think might wind up being the one we want to offer, we'll start that process while we are still interviewing to try to cut down that time. Thank you, Lauren. And um, it was just mentioned that many of these positions can be remote. Um, Jenny is a new parent. Brandon has his large dog. Can you talk a little bit about work-life balance for these positions? Well, I would describe it as my, my work-life balance is great. Um, I do have a large dog. I also have a son. and. I'm married, um, been mostly remote since COVID. Um, I'm under a, a hybrid um, agreement now, I guess you call it an agreement, Lauren, whatever it was that we filled out. But it's, you know, my, my job, I mean, I, I meet a one-on-one -on -one with faculty and I always tell them, you know, my job is to support you. So it's whatever you want to do. But everyone's kind of just transitioned to these Zoom calls like we're on right now i used to meet one-on-one -on -one, usually in their office sometimes they would come to my office you know when i was in uh, in the office full time um, but you know for now i would say my hybrid format is about 98 percent remote i mean i come in very seldomly to to campus because everything just pretty much done meeting people on zoom but you know if anybody wants to if i had a faculty who wanted me to meet them in their office that's what i would do but most of our faculty have pretty much transitioned to Zoom calls, and I think they're really fond of it because it allows them to kind of go from meeting to meeting and from, you know, whatever work project to work project pretty seamlessly and quickly rather than kind of going here and going there and, and that kind of thing. So, but yeah, I mean, I would describe work-life balance as excellent for me, so. Yeah, the, the same, same for me as well, because I mean, you know, like um, initially we used to travel to, uh, you know, like the faculty's office or, you know, they would come to us. But now everybody opts to do everything on Zoom. And so, you know, I mean, 
it saves you a lot of time. I feel like uh, I'm more productive just because, you know, like I save so much time just walking back and forth. Although, you know, I miss my 10,000 steps that I, <laughs> I used to do while, you know, traveling between offices. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, uh, my work-life balance has been great. I mean, I've been doing this, uh, I've been, I've been working at Duke for almost 16 years now. And uh, I raised my kids while, you know, I was doing that. I remember it was really hard, you know, when I used to come to work and then I had to run back home, you know, to take care of them or pick them up from school, whatever. But uh, yeah, since uh, everything's become remote, it's been really good because, you know, I can take care of them. Of course, they're, they're grown up now. I don't have to do anything. But yeah, I'll say, I mean, mm -hmm. I'll say our, our jobs are deadline driven. So mm -hmm. the closer you are to a deadline, the busier you tend to be. Mm -hmm. um, but we also control our workload. So we can plan our days and our months really kind of around managing that so that we aren't overwhelmed or we try our best to avoid it. Um, but that also means, you know, kind of as salaried employees, you work to get the work done. So we have busy times and we have not busy times. And there's not that pressure during the not busy times to go out and find something to do because three weeks to a month from now, mm -hmm. you're going to have stuff to do. You don't need to make up yeah. stuff to do. Just mm -hmm. take yeah. your time. If, and If ever I have a week that there's just not a lot going on, I don't worry about it because by the next week I could have four projects sitting on my desk, you know. And it happens all the time. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, the only other thing I'll add to this is that um, I tend, as a manager, I tend to try to protect my folks' time. Um, so, I don't have a lot of expectations of them in the evenings and weekends. Having said that, there are times where there is more work, in which case that they might get pulled into that or they may choose to work at that time. Um, so I have two folks who are permanent remote, one who is permanent remote in California. So he also um, has a kiddo who um, he was a stay at home dad for a while. So we did a very long extended workday for him. Um, and so I would say that I work with each person individually to find the right work balance for them. Um, and that for me, I in part because of my personality, but also I'm, I have a couple of folks who can reach out to me at any time um, because of the nature of our work. Um, and so there are a couple of folks in leadership who will reach out to me at off hours. Um, and that's okay for me. All right, we have reached the end of our time. This was an absolutely wonderful panel. Um, and Everyone has kindly said, reach out to them if you want more information about this type of work. So I'd like to give a big round of virtual applause to our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we hope to see you in our next discussion, which will be later on in March. And in the meantime, thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>